All right. If my microphone's working, there we go. I can welcome you all. So good to see you. So thankful to have you guys here with us. Even though we have to wear masks and we socially distance and it can feel a bit awkward, it is still so beautiful to be together, to be able to come before God together, to be in a space where you know that you are with other people who want to be with God with each other in community. And so I'm so thankful for each of you. If you are new with us today, we welcome you. We are thankful to have you join us. And if you're uh, interested in connecting with us, there will be a phone number uh, on the screen at the end of service that you can text, or you can email the office at info at spaconline.com. Uh, so that we can get your contact information, so that you can get our weekly newsletter that's sent out every Friday, SPAC in 60 Seconds, which has the various announcements, events that are happening, uh, links that you can click on so that you can stay connected. And of course, you can always check our website. Now, one of the things I wanna highlight is the marriage course that we're gonna be offering starting in November. And I am so excited about the way that the plans have come together for that because we are able to offer both an in-person version, someone hosting in their home, but also an online version for those who either time constraints, finding babysitting, stuff like that would be really difficult, or you're being careful about COVID. The marriage course is for couples of all ages, whether you are newly married uh, or you've been married 30 years. <laughs> it's a chance to learn some practical tips, have some good things to be able to apply. And the interesting thing is, is the online version, the, the time that you commit to being in a group chat together is short. It's only going to be half an hour to 45 minutes where you are actually going to hear the stories of some of the key leadership uh, couples in our church and you get to ask them the tough questions but you're never put on the spot. And then the information to go through the video and dialogue with your spouse, you can do at a time that works best for you. So a lot of flexibility in the midst of this. Now, for those of you who are joining online, we welcome you as well. And we just wanted to let you know that we will be doing communion during the service. So during worship, you might want to get the elements so that you're ready for communion at the end. And also to let you know that prayer is available. Prayer is available during the online service. You simply have to click on the button that's there available saying request prayer. And it takes you into a private chat where you can receive prayer. For those of you who are here, um, prayer will be available after service in the future, uh, starting in November. And for everyone to know, there is a link on the website that allows you to request prayer. And as you share that request, you also get to choose at what level you want that shared with, just with the pastors or with our praying community. And so, <laughs> with all of that information coming at you, we want to remember that we are here to worship God, that we come into his presence, that we can worship him, and together we come before him. And so let's continue now with music that leads us into the place with God. Good morning, SPAC family. It's so good to be with you together here in person, with you guys online. We'd welcome you to stand and to join us or to sit wherever you're comfortable. All these pieces, broken and scattered, in mercy gathered, mended and whole, empty handed, but not forsaken.
weekend, I was thinking about community as we've been thinking about our SPAC community and doing life together. I wrote a bit of a journal that I'd like to share with you. At the end of our time overseas, we were faced with the question of where home is. With family in two places in Alberta, the answer was not simple. The scale tilted with the consideration of you, our church family. SPAC, the people who witnessed our marriage covenant done by Graham almost 19 years ago, right there. The people who dedicated three of our four children. You, the extended family who sent us overseas as an extension of your ministry here and prayed and prayed and gave and gave. It's those who edited every single little email that was sent to us overseas to make sure it was safe. Those who came and visited us and prayed with us those who welcomed us back with furniture, with games, with bikes, and belonging into worship teams and small groups each time we return for a short or a long time. It's SPAC, the hoedown worship during farmer's days. Christmas Eve services with glow sticks that were cracked a little too early. It's the kids' prize wheel in the old church building. It's you who walked with us during personal crisis at the same time as going through the fire crisis. And here we are now. This season is strange and it's difficult and it's stressful. Each family needing to decide how much in-person involvement to have. But SPAC family, don't disconnect. On the first Sunday morning in-person gathering, my heart felt a little bit of healing in this place. To see the Ritter coughs, the Halls who take up their own row and who are excellent cohorts because they have children in every age. Worker M who's been stuck here for months. The Telliers who are among those who have been driving mom to doctor's appointments. And I met Trish and her family who are new to SPAC. We're all social distance, we're all wearing masks, but we're here, we're together, we're singing, we're worshiping. The next week, even though we were in Calgary, we were online with the live stream people. My heart was healed a little bit more when the SPAC family introduced who was online together was the friends and the Fulmores, and we were worshiping together. I'm so thankful for the youth leaders who are loving my teens as Matt delivers cool COVID masks to our door, as Dustin and all the youth leaders meet with our teens, taking health risks themselves, as Rob and Lena lead Bible study online for the off week for the senior high youth. We need you, SPAC. My heart goes out to the many, many young families at SPAC, with No Kids Church and also Online Family Church being a recipe for toddler meltdown, followed by parental meltdown. My hope is that these families 
and others will do the hard work of negotiating what I call the COVID comfort dance and figure out how to walk together in small groups. We need each other. And today I'm just so happy to be together in person with you and online with my SPAC family to worship together our loving Heavenly Father. Would you stand with me and let's sing together again.
memories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleasing it. I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. for answers far and wide but I know we're all searching for answers only you provide as you know just what we need before we say a word you're a good, good father it's who you are
let's just continue in prayer. God, we give great thanks for your love that pursues us. And Holy Spirit, we invite you to just come and in this next moment of silence that your presence would come, that you would reassure each individual of your love, that you would come and speak to them in the quiet. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence. God, we thank you for your love, the fact that you don't give up on us, that your acceptance of us comes as a love that pursues us, that you love us in the midst of our brokenness and hurt where we have done wrong things, where wrong things have been done to us, when we hide from you, run away from you, whether we're angry with you, you, God, love us. And in the midst of your acceptance, the way that you love us so completely that then you call us to accept and to love others. God, I pray that as you both minister to the people here, as you meet us in the midst of our difficult circumstances, the difficulties that we might be facing in marriages or relationships, at work, in our families, in our communities, where we see the pain of our world, and we know that you are at work. God, show us how it is that you want us to love others and empower us through your Holy Spirit so that we can live out that acceptance and love. And so we invite you, God, to be at work in us and amongst us. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may see. Good morning, friends. So good to see you here today. Um, we're looking at these one another commands in Scripture. And uh, these commands really help us to be the people of God. So um, today we're looking at a command that just says accept one another. Accept one another. So uh, just think about that for a moment. If you're um, online this morning, I want to invite you to respond as well. A couple of questions. What does it, why is acceptance important to us? Why is acceptance important to us as human beings? And then what does it feel like? to be accepted, when a group extends an invitation to accept us, to welcome us in, what does that feel like? So why is acceptance important? Some of you kids who are here can answer that question too. What, why is acceptance important? Go ahead. Gives you value, yeah. Good. What else? A little louder? We belong. Yeah, thanks. Cool. Yeah, that's right. So what does it feel like when you are accepted? What does it feel like when the group welcomes you in? Love. Feels like love, yeah. Good. Anything else? Anything else profound? Love is pretty profound. What else? Purified. You feel what? Purified. I can't see your lips moving underneath your mask. <laughs> I, purified. Okay. Good. Sorry, I just, it's hard to hear sometimes. Validated. Validated, okay. Anyone else? Cool. Yeah, so there's a release of fear and anxiety. That's good. So we're, we're looking at this command. It's from Romans chapter 14 and 15. There, it's found in other places in the New Testament as well. And I just want us to think, first of all, of the kind of world that we live in, that we live in a very in a very polarized world. Uh, we live in a world that is, is quite divided. If you are uh, into American politics, you know that there's a little election that's happening down south in about a week and a half. 
And the conversation seems to be quite polarized, doesn't it? So when you listen to the conversation, it really is polarized around those two parties and two people and two ways of governing the country and uh, two sets of values almost. And, uh, and the conversation is very polarized, very toxic, and one side doesn't seem to accept the other side. Other issues polarize us as well, whether it's, um, you know, w rich or poor, men, women, pandemic versus plandemic, masks versus anti-masks, there's all sorts of things. And we live in this world now where if you don't agree with the majority worldview, if you don't agree with the larger culture, the larger population, the worldview that's popular, you become a persona non grata. You become cast into the outer darkness. You become canceled. We live in this cancel culture now where if you don't agree with what others are saying, you can become canceled. Even for things that you said 10, 20, or 30 years ago, you can become canceled. And the church also can become polarized around these issues and other issues. There are all sorts of ways that we can become divided as a church. And, and that kind of environment is not a very welcoming environment. It's not the kind of environment where people feel well-received, where they feel welcomed. And most of us just want to be accepted. Most of us just want to be welcomed. I remember when I was a kid and we moved from South Africa to Vancouver, uh, I... I that, that was really what I wanted with the new country that I was moving to. I just wanted to be accepted, and so I learned how to play the sports that everyone else was playing and learned the, the language, so to speak, the, and, and, and ate the food that everyone else was eating. I just, just, wanted, just wanted acceptance. And, and if you've ever been a kid who's gone to school for the, for the first time, first day of school, with uh, people that you don't know, uh, you, you know what it's like to, to just want to be accepted or maybe even starting a job, or moving to a neighborhood, or walking through the doors of a church for the first time and not knowing anyone. The, the thing that you want the most in that context is acceptance. I just want to be accepted. And the church can only be, I think, good news to the world, to our divided world, if we're people who are accepting of one another. How can the church be good news? if we're polarized around issues. And so we're going to look at this command uh, to accept one another. I'm going to look at Romans chapter 14, verses 1 all the way to 15, verse 7. It's up on the screen. It's a lengthy text. And I'm going to read it from the message. So if you don't have the message version, I would encourage you to follow uh, up on screen. Or if you have your own screen with you, you're welcome to follow in that way. Um, Romans chapter 14. So hear the word of the Lord. This is from the message. Welcome with open arms fellow believers who don't see things the way you do and don't jump all over them every time they do or say something you don't agree with, even when it seems that they're strong on opinions but weak in the faith department. Remember they have their own history to deal with. Treat them gently. For instance, a person who has been around for a while might well be convinced that he can eat anything on the table, while another with a different background might assume all Christians should be vegetarians and eat accordingly. But since both are guests at Christ's table, wouldn't it be terribly rude if they fell to criticizing what the other ate or didn't eat? God, after all, invited them both to the table. Do you have any business crossing people off the guest list or interfering with God's welcome? If there are corrections to be made or manners to be learned, God can handle that without your help. Or say one person thinks that some days should be set aside as holy and another thinks that each day is pretty much like any other, there are good reasons either way, so each person is free to follow the convictions of conscience. What's important in all of this is that if you keep a holy day, keep it for God's sake. If you eat meat, eat it to the glory of God and thank God for prime rib. <laughs> if you're vegetarian, eat vegetables for the glory of God and thank God for broccoli. Thank God for broccoli. None of us is permitted to insist on our own way in these matters. It's God we're answerable to all the way from life to death and everything in between, not each other. That's why Jesus lived and died and then lived again, so that he could be our master across the entire range of life and death and free us from the petty tyrannies of each other. So where does that leave you when you criticize a brother and where does that leave you when you condescend to a sister? I'd say it leaves you looking pretty silly or worse. Eventually, we're all going to end up kneeling side by side in the place of judgment, facing God, 
Your critical and condescending ways aren't going to improve your position there one bit. Read it for yourself in Scripture. As I live and breathe, God says, every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will tell the honest truth that I and only I am God. So tend to your knitting. You've got hands full just taking care of your own life before God. Forget about deciding what's right for each other. Here's what you need to be concerned about, that you don't get in the way of someone else, making life more difficult than it already is. I'm convinced Jesus convinced me that everything as it is in itself is holy. We, of course, by the way, we treat it or talk about it, can contaminate it. Sorry, we, of course, by the way we treat it or talk about it, can contaminate it. If you confuse others by making a big issue over what they eat or don't eat, you're no longer a companion with them in love, are you? These, remember, are pe persons for whom Christ died. Would you risk sending them to hell over an item in their diet? Don't you dare let a piece of God-blessed food become an occasion for soul poisoning. God's kingdom isn't a matter of what you put in your stomach, for goodness sake. It's what God does with your life as he sets it straight, sets it right, puts it together, and completes it with joy. Your task is to single-mindedly serve Christ. Do that and you'll kill two birds with one stone, pleasing the God above and proving your worth to the people around you. So let's agree to use all our energy in getting along with each other. Help others with encouraging words. Don't drag them down by finding fault. You're certainly not going to permit an argument over what's served or not served at supper to wreck God's work among you, are you? I said it before and I'll say it again. All food is good. But it can turn bad if you use it badly if you use it to trip others up and send them sprawling. When you sit down to a meal, your primary concern should not be to feed your own face, but to share the life of Jesus. So be sensitive and courteous to others who are eating. Don't eat or say or do things that might interfere with the free exchange of love. Cultivate your own relationship with God, but don't impose it on others. You're fortunate if your behavior and your belief are coherent. But if you're not sure, if you notice that you're acting in ways inconsistent with what you believe, some days trying to impose your opinions on others, some days trying to please them, then you know that you're out of line. If the way you live isn't consistent with what you believe, then it's wrong. Those who are strong and able in the faith need to step in and lend a hand to those who falter and not just do what is most convenient for us. Strength is for service, not status. Each one of us needs to look after the good of the people around us, asking ourselves, how can I help? That's exactly what Jesus did. He didn't make it easy for himself by avoiding people's troubles, but waded in and helped out. I took on the troubles of the troubled, is the way the scripture puts it. Even if it was written in scripture long ago, you can be sure it's written for us. God wants the combination of his steady, constant calling and warm personal counsel in scripture to come to characterize us, keeping us alert for whatever he'll do next. May our dependably steady and warm personal God develop maturity in you so that you will get along with each other as well as Jesus gets along with us all. Then we'll be a choir, not only our voices only, but our very lives singing in harmony in a stunning anthem to God the Father of our Master Jesus. So reach out and welcome one another to God's glory. Jesus did it. Now you do it. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word today. Thank you for uh, your clear instruction to the church about accepting one another, welcoming each, welcoming each other. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. So the, the, gist, the, the, the gist of this text, the main point of this text, is that we're, spo we're supposed to welcome each other based on the welcome we've received from Jesus. We've all received a welcome from Christ in the gospel. Jesus has welcomed us. He's called us. He's taken us as we are, regardless of what our political belief is, regardless of our gender, regardless of our race, regardless of our income or our status. Jesus has opened his arms to us, and he's welcomed us, and so we're supposed to do the same for each other. We're supposed to welcome one another. And so the Apostle Paul is writing this letter to Christ followers in Rome. Uh, unlike the church in Jerusalem, which was largely Jewish with a few Gentiles that were added into the church, the church in Rome was full of Gentiles with a few Jewish believers, Jewish background believers in it. 
And one of the struggles that the early church was the incorporation of these two groups of people, the Jews and the Gentiles. The Jews had come from this monotheistic background where they worshiped one God, they were religious, they followed the, the, the Mosaic law. And, and then these Gentiles who were coming in were idol worshipers, they were polytheistic, worshiping multiple gods, all sorts of uh, pagan religious practices. And, and in God's eyes, this is like a match that's made in heaven. But in their eyes, this was no match at all. And these groups uh, hadn't referred to each other by these labels that Paul uses, but, but we can understand who they are from this passage. Uh, that in this passage, there are those who are weak in their faith and those who are strong in their faith. And there are a couple of issues that divide these two. Uh, one of the issues was uh, uh, on eating meat. Uh, so the strong would have eaten meat, the weak didn't eat meat. The reason the weak didn't eat meat is because the meat was probably or possibly used in idol worship and then sold in the marketplace, and the, the weak didn't want to contaminate themselves with, those, with the meat. The strong drink wine, the weak abstain from wine. The strong make no distinction among certain days or religious festivals, and, and the weak do. And so the real twist in this passage is that those who had a religious heritage uh, were referred to as the weak brothers. Those who had no you know, monotheistic religious heritage, those who were the idol worshipers, the pagans, those who were saved out of idolatry, are referred to as those who are strong in their faith. Kind of a twist, right? Because we would think that those who were raised in the church, those who knew how to follow God, would actually be the strong ones. And, and yet, the, it's flipped, it's twisted in this text. You have those who are strong are referred to as probably the newer Christians in this context. <clears throat> and these, these Jewish Christians believe that they were still bound by requirement to the Jewish law, to the Mosaic law. And they would oftentimes abstain from meat because, as I said earlier, the meat would have been perceived to have perhaps have been sacrificed to idols and they didn't want to contaminate themselves. And the same thing with the wine. It's not that they felt that drinking wine was wrong. Jewish people certainly dr drank wine. It was just that the, the wine that would have been sold in the marketplace could have been used in idol worship. And so they abstained from drinking wine and they observed certain religious festivals that the Jewish people were still observing. And so these strong Christians didn't observe that. And these two groups were condemning one another. The strong thought they were more enlightened and they were free and they were more progressive and they looked down on the weak and thought how unfortunate that they're so unenlightened. We're more enlightened. They should become enlightened. They had, they had an attitude of superiority. It's easy to think so when we're right. <laughs> and Paul identifies these two groups as the strong and the weak because the strong probably identified themselves this way. We're the strong ones. You're the weak ones. The weak ones condemned the strong ones because they saw them eating meat that they bought in the marketplace and drinking wine bought in the marketplace and not observing the Jewish religious festivals. And, and they were more, because they were more uh, legalistic in their approach, they, they thought that these people who were not obeying the Jewish laws were going to go to hell in a handbasket quite soon. How, how dare these worldly Christians bring their, you know, practices into the church and contaminate us and these two groups are called to do life together and yet they're polarized around these issues and Paul makes a plea to them become unified accept one another welcome one another the language is more than just tolerance you know tolerance is just choosing to get along I, I, I guess I'll go and sit in the church building with my brother or sister in Christ even though I disagree with them you know, I don't have to talk to them in the foyer. If I don't want to, I'll sit on the other side of the auditorium and just sort of glance over, maybe throw them away. But I'm just tolerating them. That, that's not the language that's being used here. The language that's being used here is more like the, the Velcro principle where you have two pieces of Velcro and on one side you have those hooks, those J-hooks, and on the other side you have those loops, and then you put the two pieces together and they, and they cling together, they stick together, the, the, the two receive each other. 
And, and that's what Paul is talking about here when he says accept one another. It's not like tolerate your brother and sister. It's actually much stronger than that. It's, it's welcoming, receiving, coming together, and becoming one with your brother or sister in Christ. And in their instance, it would have been like do life together, eat together, and drink together, and pray together, and worship together, and stick together to become one, so that you become one. All of this because of what Jesus has done for us. So then he gives us some principles on how to, how to do that. How do we actually receive one another? First of all, recognize that we're going to disagree on some matters. Recognize that in this room there will be disagreement on pretty much every issue. You know, look across the room. You probably disagree with that person on a number of issues. You're going to disagree. The reality is, is that we will disagree. We're not all going to live out our faith in the same way. We won't all vote the same way. Surprise, surprise. We won't all like the same music. We won't all dress the same way. We won't all think the same things. There, there are matters in our faith that are open to some interpretation. They're not prescribed. And Paul says to the strong ones who are probably the majority and in this position of perceived power in the church, accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. And so recognize, you are going to disagree with someone else who is a follower of Jesus, and yet you can still accept them, you can still welcome them, you can still do life with them. Secondly, stop judging one another. Scripture says one man's faith allows him to eat everything, but another man's faith, whose faith is weak, eats only vegetables. The man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not, and the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the one who does, for God has accepted him. In other words, don't judge one another in areas that are not specified by God as sin. One of the ways that we tend to judge one another in North America is on, in the area of wealth, believe it or not. Several years ago, Millard Fuller, who's the president of founder of Habitat Humanity, addressed this workshop of pastors who, at a seminary, and there were about 200 pastors in attendance, and um, he, they were talking about um, you know, Habitat for Humanity and the work that Habitat does, and how, how, do, you, how do you help uh, those who are, are less fortunate, and uh, they identified that greed and selfishness was the reason that the church never had enough money to assist other people creatively, that people were, <clears throat> you know, investing in things like houses and cars and buying all sorts of things and therefore not able to or not willing to release their funds to build houses, to feed those who are hungry and to help the poor. And, and then he asked uh, a seemingly innocent question. He said, is it possible for a person to build a house so large that it's sinful in the eyes of God. Raise your hand if you think so. All 200 of the pastors raised their hand. Yes, it is possible to build a house that's so big that it's sinful in the eyes of God. And so then Millard said, so then tell me exactly what size, what precise square footage a certain house becomes sinful to occupy. And then there was silence from the pastors and then finally there was a hand that went up at the back and this small, quiet voice spoke up and said, when it's bigger than mine. <laughs> right? It's easy to pass judgment on people. It could be that we pass judgment on people for the cars that they drive, for the way that they dress, for the piercings that they have, for the tattoos that they have or don't have, or maybe we judge people by what they drink or don't drink, and the scripture just says, stop judging other people. Stop judging why? Because Paul says, who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls, and he'll stand for the Lord is able to make him stand. Jesus is not judging your fellow brother or sister in Christ. Therefore, stop judging your fellow brother or sister in Christ. If God has already extended a welcome to someone, who are we to not extend a welcome to them? We're not their judge. God is their judge, and he's already accepted them, so who are we to judge? That's the argument that goes here. Isn't that good? God's already accepted them. Why do we judge? Why do we put ourselves in the place of God? Thirdly, don't cause others to stumble. 
We want to create an accepting environment. Don't cause others to stumble. This third principle is likely given to those who are strong or those who thought they were strong, uh, thinking that the others needed to come along, the others needed to become enlightened, the others needed to maybe even be dragged over to their way of thinking. He says, therefore, let's, not st- let's stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. We who are strong ought to bear with the failing of the weak and not to please ourselves. So this idea of a stum- stumbling block is oftentimes misapplied, I think. Um, and we use it oftentimes when we talk about, well, I don't want to put a stumbling block. You hear people talk about that in, uh, in a church context anyway. And so what is, what is this stumbling block? Well, well, here's what it's not. It's not creating offense. So sometimes you do something and you think, well, I'm creating an offense for someone. I never ever want to create, intentionally create an offense for somebody else. And so therefore I'm not going to do it. Truth of the matter is you, you will always create an offense. Even if you do the right thing, sometimes people are offended. Th- that's not what a stumbling block is. Now I'm not su- suggesting that you run around trying to offend people, but that's not what a stumbling block is. The, the reality is, is that there will always be people who are offended. In fact, some Christians make it their duty to be offended, right? It's like they're the professional weaker brother. It doesn't matter what you do, I'm going to be offended, especially if it doesn't agree with what I'm thinking. It's, it's not about taking offense. It's not even about tempting someone to sin. So, um, you know, in their context, let's think about what they're doing. There are these vegetarians, these people who would eat vegetables only, I know a few of them in my life. Um, and then the, there are those who were eating meat. They were eating steak, prime rib, as Eugene says in the message there. And so it's not the, the meat-eating people sitting down to eat meat and their vegetarian brothers looking on going, wow, that's a nice-looking steak. I think I want that steak. And they, they're tempted to, to try it, tempted to eat it. We, we oftentimes think that that's what a stumbling block is, that I'm going to do something and somebody else is going to be tempted to do that. That's not what putting a stumbling block in front of somebody, that's, that's not what it is. W- what he's talking about is that we create an environment where people feel so much pressure to go against their own conscience that they, they do the thing that they, their conscience will not allow them to do just to fit in with the group. They, they, will, they will, in their context, they will eat meat just to fit in with the meat eaters, even though their own conscience doesn't allow them to, even though they think in and of, of themselves this would be a sin, but I'm going to do it because the pressure of the group is so strong, it's so powerful, and I want to be accepted in that group, so therefore I'll eat meat just to fit into the group. So the stumbling block is causing someone to do something that goes against their own conscience. What he's saying is that if you, in passing judgment, if you, in condemning your brother and sister, pass judgment on them, and they feel such a need to be accepted that they acquiesce and do the thing that goes against their conscience just to fit in the group, you've placed a stumbling block in their way. In doing this, you're causing someone to go against their conscience just to fit into the church, and that's not right. So he's saying in using your freedom, don't create a situation where someone will feel pressured to go against their conscience just to fit in. It's better not to eat, he says, it's better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother to fall. Give up your freedom. Don't condemn someone else because they're not free. Give up your freedom. So that they will feel accepted. And then next, this is a real easy one. Keep your opinions to yourself. I want to create an accepting environment. Keep your opinions to yourself. The Greek, I think the original Greek just says shut up. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Whatever you believe about these polarizing issues, keep between yourself and God. Whatever you believe about, you know, the pandemic or the pandemic or the mass or no mass or whatever you believe about whatever that doesn't really matter that gets all of this airtime on Facebook and Twitter keep between yourself and God it's an easy one 
Uh, on these matters that, are, that, that, that don't really, really matter, keep, keep your mouth shut. Don't say anything to anyone. Don't express your opinion. You don't need to. You, we, we live in a day and age where we think that we have a right to express our opinion because we have a platform to do it, whether it's on social media or, you know, that, that's the big, the big thing, right? Everybody has a platform. Everyone has a right to express their opinion. And, and sometimes, oftentimes, it's just not helpful in creating an environment where people can feel accepted. Each of us should please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For even Christ did not please himself. We should be thinking about next, that next time we post something on social media or next time we belt something out for somebody to hear about our politics or our opinions. And then lastly, keep the gospel story front and center. If you want to create an accepting environment, keep the gospel story front and center. This is the story. The church is all about the gospel story. God's plan is to accept us as we are, and then we're supposed to accept one another. That's what God is doing. God accepts us as we are. He's welcomed us in with all of our baggage, with all of our opinions, with all of our flaws, with all of our failings, with our past, with, with, our, with our insecurities. He, he's welcomed all of us to the table. And, and, and so we're supposed to make our meetings, we're supposed to make our relationships about the gospel. God is bringing people together. He's bringing people together from different political backgrounds. He's bringing people together with different skin color and from different classes and from different economic standings and different genders, different backgrounds, bringing all sorts of people together to form one church, one voice, one heart, glorifying the Lord. And that's what we're supposed to make the church about. It's about this work that God God has been doing through Christ down through the centuries, continuing until the return of Jesus. This is the story that we're a part of. We're not part of a political story. We're part of a kingdom story. Isn't that right? And that's what we're supposed to make the church about. Make, may the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity amongst yourselves as, as you follow Christ Jesus so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then, just as Christ has accepted you in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs so that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy. Keep the story front and center. We are part of a glorious story. And the way that we can be good news to the world is to live this story out with each other in front of our friends, our neighbors, our family members. Live this story out. And then you'll begin to look like an alternate society. Then you'll begin to look like the people of God, radically welcoming one another, radically welcoming people who don't see things the way that you think, see things, don't act the way that you act. Welcome them. That's the gospel. Accept one another then, as Jesus Christ has accepted you. This is the gospel. So with that, we're going to go to the communion table. I want to invite you to come to the table and to celebrate. Those of you who are here live and in person have received communion if you're at home. We uh, encourage you to grab some communion elements, a cup or cracker, bread, whatever you have handy. Um, and I want to invite you to take this with us. So Jesus has invited us to come to the table. And as we come to the table, it's a reminder. Just hold on, just hold on. As we come to the table, it's a reminder uh, that we've been radically welcomed by Jesus. Uh, we haven't had to earn our way there. He's provided a way for, there, for us to be there, to come to the table because of what he's done for us on the cross. And he's, he welcomes you, regardless of where you're at, regardless of what you've been facing this week, regardless of what you've been thinking. Sometimes we think some horrible things. We're welcomed. Sometimes we do some horrible things. We're welcomed. Jesus has radically welcomed us to the table. And as we come to the table, remembering the radical welcome of Jesus, of, of Jesus, we accept his embrace. But we also embrace one another. 
because we come as brothers and sisters to this table. By accepting the radical welcome, the radical embrace of Jesus, we're agreeing that we're going to embrace one another. We're agreeing that we're going to accept one another because we've been accepted by Jesus. So come and receive a radical embrace from Christ and from one another. So I'm going to invite you to take the top part off of this. We're going to eat together and drink together, so wait. Jesus said, this bread is my body which has been broken for you. Take it and eat it in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. same way Jesus took the cup and he said this cup represents my blood just poured out for the forgiveness of sin take it drink it in remembrance of me let's remember Jesus Thank you, Jesus, for your amazing act of grace on our behalf, accepting us, welcoming us, drawing us. Even when we shook our fist at you, even when we declared that we didn't want anything to do with you, walked away from you, did our own thing, found ourselves in the muck and the mire of life, angry perhaps, walking away. You came after us and you welcomed us. So we thank you for that. Who does that other than God? And so help us as your children, as your sons and daughters, as your kids. To live that reality out in our day-to-day -day lives, be it in our marriage, or our families, our friendships, this church, the larger church community, that with one heart and one voice we would glorify you. Thank you for your grace. In your name we pray. Amen. Before we go, we have an announcement that we want you to watch, and uh, we're going to pray together at the end. Good morning, Stony Plain Alliance Church. Uh, my name is Dan Kaler. I am the chair of your board of elders here at SPAC. Um, with me is obviously Graham English, our senior pastor. Um, normally, I wouldn't make an announcement with a recorded video, but during the pandemic, we thought it was wise to use a format that would reach as many people as possible uh, in a timely manner. This morning, I am in the unenviable position of announcing the resignation of our senior pastor, Graham English. His last day at SPAC will be December 31st, 2020. I want you to know that Graham is leaving in health and in the best possible way, but it, it will obviously come as a shock to our community. I want to give Graham an opportunity to share his journey and how he came to his decision. So I'll be starting a new role serving the churches of the Western Canadian District primarily here in Alberta, as the director of church engagement in the northern part of our province. Uh, what that means essentially is I'll be joining the district leadership team as a director, and the focus of my ministry will be primarily in the greater Edmonton area and then surrounding that. Uh, this, this is not something that we arrived at lightly or quickly. Uh, normally in the past, Wendy and I have discerned our way through uh, various seasons of life and ministry. Uh, we've had other opportunities that have come our way, and we've taken time to discern God's will uh, through those processes. And over the last 20 years, uh, we have always felt called 
to remain here at SPAC and continue to pastor uh, this great church community. Uh, this opportunity was presented to me uh, early uh, in the summer, and I was asked to consider this role. Uh, I, I quickly said no. Uh, however, Wendy and I prayed about it through the month of July, and uh, it, kept, it kept coming back. We, we, we continued to come back to it. And again, I was asked to consider it again in, in August. And um, I decided at that point that I should talk to Dan, our board chair. And um, as I spoke with Dan um, and uh, asked him about whether or not I should consider it, he uh, said to me, you know what, I, I don't really love what that means for our church, but I think you should really have a look at it. And uh, if this is something that God is doing, uh, we certainly would want to get behind it. Uh, I want to give you the freedom to do that. That's essentially what he had said to me. And uh, I, I did discuss with him, you know, the, the timing of it all and um, talked with him about uh, the, the challenges that we're facing as a church. And, and uh, he, he and we acknowledged uh, the reality of all of that and yet um, agreed that it would be the right thing to do to look at it. And if it was something that God would want to do, that we would want to uh, move in that direction and, and continue to pursue God's will and call for our lives. Dan was very gracious and open-handed, and I'm really appreciative to you, Dan, for, for that. I also consulted uh, another advisor, reached out to another person that uh, is part of my life and a person that I've been journeying with for a number of years. And... I asked the same question of him, whether or not I should pursue that. And uh, his response was uh, pretty much the same response that Dan gave me. But he did also ask an important question of me that was really helpful. I shared my concern about the timing of all of this. And I said, essentially, this, the timing just seems to be all wrong uh, because of all that we're going through as a church. And uh, the question that he asked me that was really helpful for me in uh, moving forward. Uh, the question was simply, in the last four years, uh, when would it have been convenient or when would it have been an opportune time for you to leave? And in the next four years, when do you think it might be an opportune time for you to leave? And as I reflected on that over really a period of time, I realized that in the last four years, um, we've had a fire and relocated our church and we've um, gone through a building design process and a land search and and raising funds for a new building and um, staff transitions and, and then looking at the next four years and realizing all that awaits us. All, there's a lot of great, exciting th days ahead for Stony Plain Alliance Church uh, and a lot of leadership uh, opportunity as well. I realized that uh, he was right. Uh, there, there was no real opportune time uh, for any type of transition or any space for a transition. And uh, so as I reflected on that, Wendy and I talked and prayed some more. Um, we decided that it would be right to create the space, at least for God to speak to us about our future. Uh, and then that would ultimately mean the future of Stony Plain Alliance Church. And so after, again, a lot more prayer and a lot more discussion, uh, we submitted, I submitted my resume to the Western Canadian District and went through a process of discernment um, with them uh, through interviews and through lots of conversations and at the end of the day I was offered the role of Director of Field Engagement North and um, I accepted the role and then on Monday night of this last week uh, I submitted my resignation to the Board of Elders and I asked them if they would um, release me and if they would bless me and uh, for sure they were shocked looks around the table uh, but at the end of the night they gathered around me and uh, they laid hands on me uh, we had masks on just so that you know <laughs> and they blessed me and they um, encouraged me and they released me and uh, linked arms with us as we move um, into the future and so I'm, I'm super grateful for the board that that God has given us and uh, these people who sit around the board table are godly and, um, and, and wise. And, and they really have blessed uh, me in this process. As well as I think about our church, um, I, I want you to know that serving 
Stony Plain Alliance Church has been uh, a significant shaping experience for me. God has used you to bless us and to encourage us and to grow us and to challenge us and to express grace to us. This community has been a very significant community for us. You have been an incredible gift to us, and I want to thank you for your support of Wendy and of myself. Uh, I came here when I was 36, and I'm resigning now at the age of 56. That is a significant portion of our lives, and I'm grateful that we have spent those years, these years, here with you. The staff, um, as well, have been tremendous, and uh, when we shared with our staff on Tuesday, it was uh, a difficult announcement, and yet at the same time, uh, they too have been responding positively and are supportive of this next step, even though it means a challenging transition for our staff. Uh, I want you to know, though, that you are in good hands. Both our board and our staff have the right individuals to guide the church through this time of transition uh, toward the, a selection of a new leader. I've got full confidence in them because I know they listen to God. I know that they care about each other, and I know that they care about the church. And so uh, I want you to know that I've got full confidence in the team that we have in place to lead the church through this time. I want to turn it back over to Dan. Thanks, Graham. As much as we will be saying goodbye to Graham as our senior pastor, Graham, our friend, is not moving away. He and Wendy will uh, want to remain a part of our community. We will be planning opportunities over the next couple of months to allow people to express their thankfulness and gratitude to Graham and Wendy for their service at SPAC over the last 20 years. I want to take a moment to highlight our elders who make up your elders board. Uh, Rob Davidson joined our board this year as an apprentice and we have Jack Adkins and Jesse Bouillon, Graham Watt, Linnea Nielsen, Jason Ritterkoff, Clark Mills, and Stefan Potgeiter. You should know that your elders board is full of great leaders who love God's church and are well positioned to lead, st lead SPAC through this transition. At our Converge in November and in the coming weeks and months, I will be communicating to our congregation uh, the board's roadmap for processing this transition. We want to make sure that we don't rush this process, that we take time to listen to God's leading in all of this. I'd like to invite some of the elders to come forward. Uh, they're going to pray for Graham and Wendy as we close this part of the service. Well, church, uh, one uh, advantage of wearing masks is you can't hear the air sucking in. Uh, this, is a, this is a remarkable time. Those of us who have been, in, uh, who have been active churchmen for, a, uh, for decades, uh, I just want to tell you how rare it is for a pastor to uh, be in the same place for 20 years. Uh, so we have been incredibly fortunate and blessed to have Graham and Wendy uh, leading us for 20 years. I was uh, chairman of the board when we, when we called him, and I very much appreciate the fact that uh, Graham has been willing to allow lay people to take positions of leadership in the church and, uh, you know, use our gifts and develop our gifts uh, for the kingdom, and, and so I appreciate that so much. I, I said in the first service that uh, this has been perhaps for me personally the most invigorating uh, two decades of church work, and so I, uh, I thank Graham and Wendy for, for setting the infrastructure so that that could, could, that, that could be. Uh, we talked a little bit of board a meeting the other night, and, I, and I, uh, I'm going to propose something to us this morning as we pray for uh, Graham and Wendy. I'm going to um, I'm going to suggest that we use this as kind of a commissioning time. I think that will take the sting out of it because uh, people always have a thousand questions. But let's just 
let's just position this as our opportunity to send uh, Graham and Wendy on to the next adventure in this uh, uh, trajectory called the, the life of Christ. So let's, uh, let's bow our heads and let's bless them and invoke God's blessing on them in, in the doing. Uh, Father, today, we're, we're so grateful for the life and ministry of Graham and, and Wendy. And first, we thank you so much for your sovereignty, recognizing that there are no surprises for you in the kingdom. And so uh, even though we might find ourselves a little surprised and maybe unnerved by the whole thing, we recognize that you are in control. And, we, uh, and because of that, we are able to release uh, Graham and Wendy. Moreover, we're able to send Graham and Wendy. So we thank you for your faithfulness, God, like in First Thessalonians, where you have assured us that when you call us, you are faithful to take us there. So we want to... Uh, we want to pray for Graham and Wendy, even in the logistics of a transition and how it can be sometimes a bit unsettling. You feel like you have one leg in the air, but we just pray that you will allow all the elements of this transition to fall, fall into place for Wayne and Gren, uh, uh, Wendy and Graham. And then we also pray for our church uh, and recognizing that in our church family, there will be a certain amount of grieving in the leaving. And so I just pray that your peace uh, would just fall on each member of our faith community. Uh, we also, more importantly, would pray for the Holy Spirit's anointing on Graham and Wendy, something maybe new and something fresh. And we pray that you would release in them the, the giftedness they will require to experience a successful, fruitful, and rewarding ministry in the years ahead. And for our church, God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would nudge us uh, so that we can continue to stand in the gap for them. And then, God, we recognize, like the prophet Jeremiah, uh, that your plans for us and our welfare is for good, not for evil. And so we can anticipate a hopeful future because you said that in your word. Uh, God, I just pray that we would bless them as you bless them. Uh, I pray that uh, in every thought of them, we would, uh, we would bless them. And so we ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you, Clark. Um, as I'm sure you can guess, the first service heard this same announcement, so um, it's significantly out in our, our community. Um, I would ask if you could just keep it, um, keep it to ourselves just for a few more hours. There's going to be an email that's going to be sent out this afternoon to our, uh, the rest of our congregation who can't make it uh, in person or to the live service. Uh, with a link for this video so that everybody can get that message. Um, we want to give Graham the opportunity to communicate his message um, firsthand to, to as many people as we can. Um, obviously, later this afternoon, it's going to be public knowledge, and, and we expect. Um, and I hope that you guys are able to have great conversations um, and, and process this in a, in a healthy way. So I'm going to let Matt give us our benediction. Okay, well, why don't we stand together for the Lord's Prayer? And so some of you have vines, and some of you have debts, and some of you have trespasses, and we're going to choose to accept one another's versions of the Lord's Prayer together here. So let's pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So if you're joining us on the live stream, I just invite you to stick around and chat. Uh, 
you know, maybe you need to process this with each other. And if you're looking for prayer, um, you can p click the prayer ch uh, button and there'll be a, a live chat that'll pop up on the side so you can privately chat with those who are there. And if you're here, I uh, invite you to wait for the ushers to, to dismiss you. And so church family, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind towards one another that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice you may glorify God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Go in peace, my friend.